This is part of the Montpelier Play Series. My name is Erica Hampel. I am a student with UVM in the Field Naturalist Program, and I'm organizing the Play Series, um, which this is the seventh event in, I believe. So thank you for, if you've been to, to, to the past events, thank you. If you uh, are coming to the, if you're interested in coming to more, there's going to be one more in this series, and there's a question box in the front for if you want to see something new come up, come up down the pipe. Um, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, the Hunger Mountain Co-op, the Ben and Jerry's Foundation, and the Vermont Community Foundation. Um, and I just want to introduce our speaker today, who is Sean Beckett, over here. He's going to talk to you. Um, and, <laughs> and then lead you on, uh, hopefully, a, uh, you can come tomorrow, too, for a really great field walk at 9 in the morning. Um, Sean is, works at North Branch Nature Center here. and. Um, just really excited about rocks. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you can share that excitement with you. Thank you. All right, hello everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to see you all. Thanks for coming out to talk about rocks all night. Um, so I have some notes to myself here, which I need to make bigger. Hang on one second. Well, I guess I won't. Um, so um, the first note to myself is to tell you where we're meeting tomorrow. Um, so I don't forget. So if anyone wants to join us for the field walk tomorrow, um, we're going to meet at, uh, the field walk is 9 to noon, and it's going to be um, starting at Gateway Park. So if you go down uh, Route 2 um, past Greenmont Cemetery, just across the street from Greenmont Cemetery, there's kind of like a parking area that's actually called Gateway Park right under the interstate. Uh, it's like a fishing access. There's lots of place for parking there, so we'll convene there, and we're going to walk across into Greenmont Cemetery and check out some escarpments at the back of the cemetery. So we're just meeting at Gateway Park. Um, and then we're going to travel to a couple other places um, around town over the course of the morning. Um, but if you want to join us, 9 o'clock at Gateway Park is the place. We should encourage carpooling, Paige, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so if you know anyone else in the room who might be going, uh, see if you can carpool to Gateway Park. We can also carpool, Gateway Park would be a fine place to leave a car too if folks want to carpool from there um, uh, across town after that. We'll, we'll be staying within the city limits pretty much um, the whole morning, so. Sound good? Okay. My name's Sean Beckett. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm the program director here at North Branch Nature Center. Um, I teach in the, I'm a graduate of the UVM Field Naturalist program as well. Um, I teach with the Vermont Master Naturalist program. Many of you are, have done this program or are in it currently. Raise your hand if that's the case. One, two, three, four, nice. Um, and um, I found that um, in my um, explorations as, a ge as, a, as an ecologist, um, I keep coming back again and again to the fact that rocks are really the most important thing out there. Um, everything can be explained by the geology, by what's going on underfoot. <clears throat> um, you know, there's, um, as a botanist, we can walk into the woods and we can see particular kinds of tree species and expect where they're going to be growing. And if we see a maple tree, we know there's going to be, you know, probably a yellow birch tree growing nearby. There's certain patterns that we can that we can expect to see as ecologists when we walk around our natural landscape. But there's also incredible uh, connections between our our geologic story and our natural landscape, or I should say, like the, the botanical world on top of that. Um, and I think in certain places. You know, if you were to tell me or to tell someone who knew these things um, what kind of rock you were standing on, not only could that person then even imagine what kind of forest was growing on top of it, but could even imagine the sound of the bird songs that were singing on top of that. So when I think of the, you know, the Moncton Quartzite Formation in Burlington, I am listening to the sounds of wood thrushes in my head. And when I think about the Moortown formation, uh, phyllite formations in, uh, in Western Montpelier, I'm thinking about the sounds of hermit thrushes in my head. And I'm thinking about you know, the hemlock trees that are growing around. So I just love like, the geological determinism of it all. How what's underfoot really totally explains <clears throat> what's happening around us. And that doesn't stop with the natural world either. Um, I would argue that our built environment um, is, can be tied back in many ways to what's happening geologically in an area. <clears throat> and one of the things I want to introduce tonight, just plant the seed, <clears throat> is that many of the decisions we've made around Montpelier's architecture and what we're building our buildings out of and why and where can be tied either in large part or small part 
to what's going on underground. And I just think that's a really cool idea. And it makes our, um, our city unique to, to, to place, right? <clears throat> um, I should also take a moment to acknowledge that we are on Western Abenaki land. And although um, tonight I'm introducing this, this story to us in terms of how geology is connected to our way of life, but this is, this is, this is not news to the Abenaki people who for 12,000 years, um, geology has been part of their way of life. And, and this is not a new story to them. This is a 12,000 year old story. And so I'm inviting you to start this story tonight. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about uh, we're going to go back into the past 500 million years, and we're going to go fast forwarding up to uh, today and looking at how, we, how some of our buildings are, <clears throat> are, are where they are. So um, this is a beautiful watercolor by a field naturalist alumni, uh, Claire Dacey is her name. And this is nice and representative of <clears throat> the parts of the earth that we tend to think about are the parts that are in color here. The parts that we can see, the waters, the trees, the roads and buildings and houses, the birds, the sky, right? Um, but those are all layers of our you know, landscape layer cake. But those layers go underground too, <clears throat> into, into the ground. When we talk about geology, just to get us all on the same page here, we're talking about one of two things. When we talk about geology, we can be talking about the bedrock, right? <clears throat> and bedrock is beneath everywhere on the planet. So whether you're standing here, whether you're in the middle of the ocean, if you go down far enough, you're going to hit bedrock. In many, in many cases, you know, your foot is already on bedrock as soon as you walk out the door. Or if you're you know, up on top of a mountain or on, on the edge of a ledge, you know, you're touching bedrock. Rock that is connected contiguously all the way through the crust of the earth. Um, in many cases, that bedrock is buried under tens or hundreds of feet of sediment or beneath hundreds of feet of water, but if you go down far enough, you're gonna hit bedrock. So when we talk about geology, we could be talking about bedrock. We could also be talking about surficial stuff, or glacier junk, I kind of call it. So anything that's not nailed down into the bedrock um, is susceptible to be moved around by all the dynamic forces in our landscape. So um, glaciers coming and scouring the landscape, um, streams eroding away our mountains, moving silt and clay and cobble and sediment um, across the land, you know, spitting it out into huge piles here and, and scouring it away there, um, and leaving um, sediment of all different sizes from as fine as flour to boulders as big as houses, kind of strewn about our landscape in non-random ways. So geologists really have uh, two things at once to study, the bedrock and then all the superficial stuff on top of it. So when it came to think, thinking about how we would break down tonight's talk, it made sense to do this in two acts. Act one is going to be about the bedrock, and act two is going to be about all the superficial stuff sitting on top of it. So act one we're going to call the geologic frontier of Vermont, because uh, I'm going to argue that Montpelier is the geologic frontier of Vermont. It's a very interesting place geologically, and it's very apropos that the, uh, the seat of uh, state government sits right here um, in, in a way. Montpelier's bedrock geology is, um, is descriptive of the entire story of Vermont's um, geological history. Then act two, we're gonna call when the earth is flat um, and talking about how, um, how the glaciers and the ice ages have shaped a lot of our landscape around us. So going into act one here, we have, uh, we're gonna break this into basically three Three scenes. There's three things that, that I want you to walk away with um, in our bedrock geology story. Um, and there's going to be three different types of rocks um, that you're going to hopefully be familiar with and be able to recognize when you see <clears throat> after tonight. And these three different types of rock represents three different scenes in Vermont's bedrock geology story. We have scene, scene one is the formation of the Green Mountains. This, is called, this event was called the Taconic Orogeny. And orogeny is just a fancy word for a mountain forming event. Scene two is when Montpelier loses its beachfront. Did you know that Montpelier was beachfront property at one point? Um, so scene number two is the Acadian orogeny, another mountain forming event. And then scene number three is all, of all, all the little granite bubbles, all the volcanics that we have strewn about central Vermont. We'll talk about that too. Now, 
It's always a good idea to get your bearings when talking about geology because we talk, we're talking about things that have happened over such grand time scales that it's really hard to wrap our minds around the, the scale of it all. And so I love this figure because this basically takes a timeline of the age of the Earth and it wraps into a big spiral so you can actually fit it in a slide. <laughs> so, so the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and that's right here in the middle. And if you unwind this um, all the way, we go three and a half, well, actually, we go four billion years before we get to right about here where the color starts changing. And this, I know you can't read this, it doesn't matter. It says Cambrian. The Cambrian era right here is where it starts changing color. And that's where we're going to start our story, is, is right here. The story of Vermont's bedrock geology, as we know it, um, starts here and it works our way towards, towards the present. <clears throat> um, another kind of background thing that is important for us to all be on the same page about is that Earth. Earth's um, geology is a very dynamic thing. The Earth is uh, made up of tectonic plates that are kind of like jigsaw puzzle pieces that are floating in water, a sphere of water, right? And really, they're floating on a sphere of magma, of molten magma. <clears throat> and these, these puzzle pieces are being pushed and moved around all the time. Not very fast, about the same uh, speed at which your fingernails grow, is how fast these continents are moving around. But over the span of millions or even billions of years, these continents can really um, uh, become reshaped and buried and exposed and change and move so that the, the Earth's continents, as they would be you know, here in the timeline, are going to be totally unrecognizable to us um, now. So we're starting the story you know, here 500 million years ago at kind of the edge of the spiral. Because if you go much farther back than that, we just can't really keep track of what things look like because all the dynamic forces have kind of erased, um, all the chaos has erased um, what, was, what was before. So I want to share now um, a great video that, um, that is a diagram of the last 500 million years of geologic time. And let's cross our fingers that this works. <clears throat> we'll do it this way. <clears throat> and would you mind uh, hitting the lights for us there in the corner, Nona? Uh, other side. Perfect, thank you. What's that? Sound is off? Yep. Hmm? Oh, I don't want the sound on. Yeah, thanks, though. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to have the YouTube do the talking for the rest of the. <clears throat> so, uh, this is going to be kind of, as we know it, the, the movement of our continents <clears throat> from 500 million years ago. This is really the story of Vermont's bedrock geology. <clears throat> so, Things are moving slowly here, but I want you to find um, North America. We're kind of below the equator on its side 520 million years ago here. And you'll see that Vermont over here is underwater. We're not, we're not land yet. This is where Vermont would be, but it doesn't exist yet right now. But this here is the tectonic plate that we sit on, Laurentia, it's called. And what's ha going to happen about 500 million years ago is this pile of volcanic islands is going to um, move towards the edge of Laurentia and slam into it. And when it does, there's going to be this mountain range right here that starts to form and come into existence. See that? You just watch the green mountains form right there. <clears throat> but um, now what's going to happen is it's going to be a quiet period for about 30 to 50 million years where nothing's really happening. We have this nice ocean out here that's getting narrower and narrower as this next as this continent right here, this is kind of a proto-European continent called Avalonia. And the tail of this continent is going to come in and whack into the edge of Laurentia in kind of a multi-car pileup sort of situation here. All right? And the forces of, this, um, of, of um, Avalonia kind of ramming into here are going to put the rest of Vermont in place. So everything east of the Green Mountains. So right now, these Green Mountains are basically dropping off right into the water. And if you're sitting on top of Mount Mansfield, well, one, you'd probably be 20,000 feet in the air because this was a tremendous mountain range at the time. It's had 400 million years to erode, right? 
Um, and uh, as you looked off to the east for 400 million years, you'd see this, this, um, this continental landmass coming towards you and slamming in to the edge of the continent. So watch for that. Brace yourself. <laughs> so now we welcome Eastern Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine to New England. No, that's down, that's down here. The map projection is really weird to just show North America. But Africa is actually down here. And that has nothing to do with our story. It kind of whacks into the south of Florida at some point. Um, but really, right now, up in Vermont, nothing's happening. We are, we are landlocked, or I should say, we are far from the continental, or from the uh, tectonic plate boundary. So all this moving and, and everything that happens after this point um, in the history of Earth's plate tectonics are irrelevant to Vermont. Um, because it's happening way over there. We're no longer right at the edge, the active edge of things slamming into each other. We are landlocked with you know, New Hampshire and Maine off to, our, off to our east at that point. So um, things get pretty quiet here um, in Vermont. Meanwhile, the southern Appalachians are forming and growing. All sorts of weird things are happening. This is Pangea. I'm just going to kind of zoom forward a little bit here. Um, this is Pangea. Right, the, uh, one of the supercontinents, most recent supercontinent where everything was kind of, uh, had kind of glommed onto all the continents that kind of found themselves. <clears throat> but again, Vermont doesn't really care. It's kind of over here. doesn't know that Pangea is happening and all this kind of stuff, right? We are, we are pleasantly in the midst of, uh, um, you know, just, just, we just, you know, we're just out there in the middle of uh, the continent. I'm going to, back up and just play that first bit again just so that you can see that again with some context now. And, um, and a shout out to, um, uh, what's this fellow's name, Sco uh, Scotese, um, out of University of Chicago and University of Texas, Arlington, who uh, created this paleo map project, these great figures. So we have this island arc here. This island arc is kind of, think about it as uh, like Japan, like the islands of Japan. These volcanic islands at the very edge of a major tectonic plate margin. And so this whole Proto-European plate is coming towards um, Laurentia, and it will slam into it. And this is the Taconic orogeny, scene one. OK? Now we have the greens. And now we have this trough closing. The green mountains are eroding away now into this trough. And then um, Avalonia comes in, and it scrapes that trough back up against the edge of North America. And we end up with our eastern Vermont. Is the, is the light blue just shallow water? I think the light blue is just shallow water, yeah. Yep. Yep. And you know, this, this is a great diagram um, you know, at the large scale of seeing what's going on. If you were to like hold up a magnifying glass, it would be a little bit off of what's actually happening, but it's, it's pretty darn handy to show. And it's all below the equator? At this point, all this is happening around the equator. Yeah, yeah, so this is a very tropical, well, there, you know, this is also 500 million years ago, so we didn't exactly have, um, you know, forests and, and whatnot, but it was a, uh, at, around, the, around the equators, yeah. So I just want to show you kind of a cross-section diagram of that story basically happening. We have proto-North America over here, proto-Europe over here. These plates are converging. Um, if we are over on the eastern edge of New York, we'd be on the, uh, on the shores of the, this Iapetus Ocean, looking at this, uh, this uh, volcanic island arc coming towards us here, forming the Taconic orogeny. Now, this is where things get interesting. So, um, if you are standing at the shores of Lake Champlain, let's say, and you walk into the water, you're standing in sand, right? You're at the beach. But you know that the farther you walk into the lake, the muckier and muckier and muckier it gets underfoot, right? That sediment size starts to get finer and finer and gloopier and gloopier the farther you get into the lake. Where if you want a sample of really good, fine lake, uh, like lake clay, you go out to the middle of Lake Champlain and you uh, take a sample from there. The farther away you are from the shore, 
whether it's a lake or whether it's the ocean, the finer and finer the sediments are that are going to settle there. So the sediments that are eroding off of, um, off of North America, off of Laurentia, into the Atlas Ocean are very different here than down here. When we're near shore, at a place that's near shore, we're looking at um, deposits of sand. We're looking at deposits, we're, we're in a place that's very, um, uh, has a lot of light penetrating, so there's lots of uh, life. There's lots of coral, there's lots of invertebrates, uh, mollusks with shells, things like that, algae, diatoms, lots of things that create limestone and, and limey stuff, right? Um, the farther we get out here into the deep water off the continental shelf, this is where things like silt and clay are depositing. And it's so deep that um, there's no light penetrating there. We don't really have much life out here. So as the millions of years go by, sediment is accumulating off the shore. That's eroding off of the continents. And the sediment that is here is different than the sediment that's down here. These sediments are building up, again, over millions or tens or even hundreds of millions of years. So the sediment can be piled miles and miles and miles deep. And the weight of the sediment on top of itself, plus the, just the, the, um, the water in the picture here, cements that rock together and lithifies it. Lithifies a word that just basically means to become a rock. So the sand is lithified into sandstone. The limey stuff is lithified into limestone out here. That mud is lithified into mudstone, or shale is another word for that, right? Um, and so we have all these sedimentary rocks, layers and layers of it, miles and miles thick that are forming over this time. And when this island arc comes in and, uh, and slams into uh, Laurentia, it, it um, basically scours and pushes all of this rock up with it. Kind of, I like to think of it as like if you are trying to plow a driveway, um, and you push the plow into it, and it, it piles up this big pile of snow at the end of the driveway. That is what's happening here, where you have the North American plate that's sliding underneath and subducting beneath the, I should do it this way. Um, Proto-North America plate is sliding down below the incoming European plate, and it scours and pushes those miles of, of rock up in front of it. And so what we see is that over here, this is the Champlain Valley has just been added to Laurentia now from all these rocks that were pushed from near shore. And the Green Mountains is all this junk, all the stuff that was pushed up from farther deep in the water. And um, this volcanic island arc um, erodes away quickly. And basically, you know, we're not very far from the ocean here. Montpelier is basically sitting right, at the, right, right in here and looking off into the Iapetus Ocean. This is our bedrock geology map. Yes? When you talk about sediment at that stage, like what is it? Is it bits and pieces of different kinds of rock? Because it's not plant material or dead end. No, it's, it's just sand, it's silt, kind of clay, and, and dissolved, um, lime, like dissolved calcium. Yeah, so it's all, the, it's all the stuff that's eroded off of the landscape into the ocean. So it's the same, you know, the same stuff that's, you know, that runs through any stream, really. It's, yeah, it's just you know, sand, but silt, it's clay. All, Well, uh, eroding off of, off of land is all uh, s sediments of weathered, basically what was weathered rock. So the, the, the landscape, the, the rock of the continent is weathering and eroding into grains of sand and grains of silt and grains of clay, which gets swept downstream into the ocean and then gets, get deposited out there. You're right that there isn't, you know, there's, there's not a ton of uh, life yet on, on land. Um, in the water at this point, there is life. And so you, it, near shore, you do have a lot of um, coral reefs and that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, the sediment is made up of weathered rock that's, that's uh, coming off the continent. This is um, northern Vermont. Just for context, Montpelier is this yellow square, yellow circle in the middle. And here's Burlington right here, Colchester Causeway, South Hero. Um, so this is just northern Vermont on this bedrock geology map. And a huge kudos to our state geologists in the Vermont Geological Survey, because they have it a lot harder than, say, like Kansas. Uh, if you look at the bedrock geology map out in other places, it's not this interesting. Um, I, was, I, would, I don't know this for sure, but I, I, I might wager that Vermont has the, like, for its size, has the coolest 
and most complex bedrock geology story of any, of any six million acre chunk of this country. <laughs> um, so we have the Champlain Valley over here, and we have all this stuff is the Green Mountains, okay? If you wanna go in uh, Vermont and find some really good limestone um, or really good sandstone, you go to Burlington, you go to Colchester, you go around here, all, you know, these, these, these rocks here are these rocks here, all these nearshore things, right? When we go into the Green Mountains, we're looking at rocks that are metamorphosed uh, mudstone that came from, well, I won't go too far back, but metamorphosed mudstone that came from way deep in the Appetus Ocean. And, uh, and so this is um, um, mud that's been turned into shale, and shale, when you metamorphose, when you metamorphose shale, um, it, you, you call that rock um, either phyllite or schist or slate, depending on how much metamorphism it gets. I can talk about that later, or tomorrow, actually. It'd be a good time to talk about that. But, but basically, the rocks that we have in the Green Mountains are these deep water, really old rocks that are put up there by, the, by the, um, uh, this taconic orogeny event. Yeah, Deb. They're huge, yes. Hold that thought for two slides. Yeah. So Maybe three slides. Oh, we're not there yet. Oh, okay. That was just scene one. We're only at, so right, so right now, oh, so, okay, so this all, this, all this rock here, the Green Mountains, what this looks like is, is, um, is this. Can we pop the lights back on, Nona, please? If you have a rock, can you hold it up? Yeah, or look around on the chairs next to you, and if you, have, and if you see a rock, hold it up in the air. I handed out like 10 rocks. I know they're out there. <laughs> All right, winner. This one. And I know there's got to be more than this. Oh, that one. Let's see. Oh, that's not it. OK. So. Um, so this, this rock that, that is basically the western half of Montpelier and throughout the greens, um, it looks like this. It's kind of bluish, kind of greenish. Um, it is um, called schist or phyllite, depending on exactly where you're standing. And it is a metamorphosed mudstone. Its source are from ancient muds and clays that are accumulating in the deep water way out far from shore. Um, this geologists call this formation the Moortown Formation. So Montpelier, right, right here, the western half of Montpelier, all this beige stuff is this bluish green rock. So I'm gonna pass this around and convince yourself in this weird light that it's, or the lights that are soon to be off again, that this is a bluish greenish sort of rock. And maybe we can pass around this other example of it too. So these came from Hubbard Park. These in fact came from Erica's field walk last week. Um, so if you are, and I'll, I'll explain exactly where uh, these are, but if you are really anywhere in the left half of Montpelier, um, this is the rock that you'll find. What's that? Say it again. Yeah, so the green mountain, I mean, so. So the question was, how did the Green Mountains, did, is the fact that this rock is greenish blue, is that how the Green Mountains got their name? And I would like to think so. The, I, I think it's just because they're forested and green and that sort of thing. But, but, the, but the rocks, um, the rocks are, do kind of have this, this greenish, bluish kind of hue to them. Um, and Nona, would you put the lights maybe halfway down? Yeah, great. So, these, you know, if, this is a Greenmont Cemetery. It's a rock, rock escarpment here. Um, if you go anywhere around most of Hubbard Park, it um, looks like this as well. Here at the Nature Center, it looks like this. So greenish, bluish rock, um, kind of slabby. Just hold that thought and, and kind of put a mental bookmark on what this looks like. Tomorrow we'll actually explore this. You'll get to see it up close, okay? Now Deb's question, how big were the mountains? So these mountains were huge. The Green Mountains have had 500 million years to basically erode away, and they're still this big. Um, so these mountain ranges would have been the size of the Himalayas at the time that they were um, at, their, at their, their peak. And so at this time, um, after the Taconic Orogeny, Montpelier was sitting right at the shore of the Iapetus Ocean with a giant Himalayan-sized mountain range just out back. So if you were to walk up to the top of Hubbard Park, it would be a much 
longer walk um, <laughs> back, back then, right? Um, and for the next 30 to 50 million years, nothing was happening. Uh, Montpelier was just enjoying itself here on the, on the shore and things were eroding away. As soon as mountains form, they start to erode back into, uh, back into the sea, right? And so while that Avalonia was kind of coming in and getting ready to slam into, um, to, to slam into Montpelier, um, all of this was eroding away. In the same process we were talking about before, where this, this sedimentation happens, um, was happening you know, then too, except now Montpelier is right at the shore here. And all this near shore sediment is made up of everything that just eroded off of the Green Mountains. All those mountains that just got pushed back up, all the most easily erodible, easily, easiest to dissolve uh, minerals and rocks were, were the first things to kind of melt off of those and find their way back into, into the ocean. So a lot of the stuff that had you know, calcium carbonate in it that was pushed up real high was the first thing to dissolve and wind up back in the ocean. Um, so anyway, all these sediments here that then lithified, and then we had another one of these mountain forming events. Where here we have the, the Green Mountains and that first um, volcanic island arc that slammed into us. Montpelier is here. And we have this, um, this trough of the Apatis Ocean that the mountains are um, eroding into. A new sedimentary rock is lithifying. Then Avalonia comes in and scrapes it all back up against, um, against Montpelier. And now, once that happens, if you're standing at the top of Hubbard Park looking east, you're no longer looking out into the Apatis Ocean. You're looking out across eastern Vermont. And way out in the distance, you see New Hampshire and you see Maine. So here we are in Montpelier. Everything to the west is all kind of green mountain formations. Everything to the east is all the result of the Acadian orogeny. And these rocks here look totally different. They look like this. Right? This is not greenish blue. These rocks are charcoal gray. They're black when they weather. They uh, weather oftentimes it's like rusty orange color. Right? They're a really striking, beautiful formation. And it's very variable. And it's really variable because, um, remember, all this stuff was eroding off of the Green Mountains into the Apatis Ocean. And that was a catastrophic, that was a, that was, it was near shore and it was a very kind of chaotic time. You know, one day you have a big landslide that dumps a bunch of sand into the ocean. Next day, uh, you know, something else happens and a big landslide happens over here. Then maybe nothing happens for a while and kind of clay just kind of settles down. So it's just a very dynamic environment near the shore of this, this eroding um, Green Mountain Range. And as a result, the rocks that we get are also very dynamic. If you are standing at one point, uh, at one part of this, this ledge here, you're looking at a rock that could be compositionally very different than you know, 10 feet away because this is just a very active environment. The depositional environment when that sediment was first going down was very active. So Nona, thanks for standing there and doing the lights. Lights on, please. <laughs> um, hold up your rocks if you still have them. Great. So I know there's more than that out there. But um, let's see. So you have the Moortown Formation. Um, Paige, you have more town formation. Yeah. This here is the, the Waits River formation. This is the, the other kind of rock here. And we can pass these to you. Those are some more chunks of the Waits River formation. So you can look carefully and see that there's little bits of rusty bits in there, but largely it's, it's, it's black, charcoal gray. Hard to see in this, in this, sort of, in this light here. But. So that's scene two. In scene three, Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, that's perfect, perfect lead in. OK, you might notice that there's these big red blobs all over. Is that what you're wondering about? OK, so we have this like really north-south running geologic map, right? You can just picture this being accordion together as a result of those mountain forming events, right? You understand now why everything is oriented north-south because of this dramatic pressure of the Taconic orogeny. And then the Acadian orogeny. And yet then we have these weird, these weird blobs of this orange-white dotted stuff from the map. That's the, That's the volcanic stuff. Yeah. So meanwhile, while all this was happening with the Acadian orogeny, um, whenever you have a, a plate boundary that's subducting beneath um, another um, plate, 
that's an Im immense amount of crust that is being burned and melted into the mantle down below. And as that all melts, it creates an incredible amount of, of pressure. And so the, the magma that is being formed from this just melting into the, into the mantle um, starts rising back up through the crust. And it's burning its way up through the crust towards the surface. It's, it's really hot. It's really gaseous. It wants to kind of move upwards. And so it's just kind of melt. It's, as it melts, it kind of moves its way up like the bubbles in your soda right, through the Earth. And if that magma makes it all the way to the surface, then we know that as a volcano. But more often than not, it kind of peters out before it gets there. Um, as it gets closer and closer to the surface, it's cooling down more and more and more to the point where it's not really active anymore. And it just kind of settles in place under, underground. And you end up with these little pillows um, or like balloons of magma that are beneath the Earth's surface. These are called plutons. And these are granite. Granite is the igneous rock that you get um, from this process. And granite is also a very strong rock compared to the limestones and sandstones and schists that we've been talking about. And so over the span of hundreds of millions of years, as the whole Vermont landscape erodes away into the ocean, it reveals these um, plutons that uh, don't erode away as easily. And so. Uh, so um, granite is basically cooled magma. So, and any rock can become magma once you melt it. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. And so these are both kind of heavy. Yeah, this is, this is light enough to pass around. So here's a big hunk of granite. And if you look at this carefully, um, if you're willing to take that thing, Brian. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you can yeah you can look at the crystals formed in there and you know every every granite out and we'll actually we'll circle back to this in a moment but every granite outcrop every pluton has a different kind of signature of of the size of those minerals and also the composition of them the ratio of feldspar to quartz to mica or you know things like that um, and so you can tell where a chunk of granite came from if you can match it to the chemistry of, of the surrounding plutons. So every one of these uh, orange bubbles is a magma pluton that has, a granite pluton that has been revealed through erosion of everything around it. Yeah, Nona. Um, I understand that the granite is magma. Mm -hmm. Is that the same thing as This microphone can hear it, and also um, uh, you can hear that. So Nona was, was noticing that when you cross in a plain field, suddenly you end up in um, granite land. Groton State Forest, right, all that is all, all granite. That's what this big, all this big thing here is all, is all Groton State Forest and plain field and whatnot. And it's a sudden transition because the edges of those plutons are very discrete. Now, why does it, is it a coincidence that the river happens to be the, the thing that delineates it? Now, I don't, without going there and looking at a escarpment on one side of the river and looking at it on the other, I, I don't know. But, but rivers tend to find contact points between geologic layers because those are point of weaknesses. And rivers, when they find a spot of weakness, it can erode in there and then kind of like a knife through butter, it just kind of incises itself into a path that it likes. And so it could be that the edge of that pluton is just a nice space for that where that river kind of tucked into and, and is followed. OK. So quick act one recap, and then we're going to go on a tour of some sites in Montpelier here. Montpelier is at Vermont's geologic crossroads because we are sitting at a spot where everything to the, west ha the western half of Montpelier is all one type of very old rock. Everything to the east, uh, east half of Montpelier is a much younger, very different type of rock with a very different story. And we have um, these granite outcrops kind of not in Montpelier, but all around us that contribute to our story as well. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Because um, we're going to, that's exactly what I'm going to do next. I'm going to show you some zoomed in, in maps. And I'm going to do some zoomed in maps, and then we're going to go to a couple spots here. So, first, I actually want to start with 
the orange bubbles and whatnot. You'll see that there's not a lot of orange bubbles right around Montpelier. <clears throat> if we zoom in to Montpelier here, um, this is actually that, that line between the Moortown Formation, the Waits River Formation. It runs right through here, runs right through the middle of Hubbard Park. North Branch Nature Center is all Moortown Formation, but if you actually go across, um, like over the Vine Street Bridge, you're back in the purple stuff. If you're on, you know, Franklin Street, it's all Waits River Formation. If you're over here, you know, at CCV, it's all Moortown Formation, and it's a sudden transition. Um, but I want to direct your attention there, down here, to this tiny little sliver of orange, right? Has anybody been there before? This is Bur the north end of Berlin Pond, right there, cut off at the edge of the map. And if you go here, uh, no, no, would you hit the lights, please? Thank you. <laughs> so north end of Berlin Pond. This is Crosstown Road that takes us down to West Berlin. Should probably use this. Um, and then right here is the parking lot for Boyer State Forest. This is all Boyer State Forest and Irish Hill Trails, Darling Hill Trails. Um, and if you park here and you walk in, you're walking in through all that Waits River formation, all the blue stuff, all that black, rusty looking kind of um, slabby stuff. And then you hit this spot, and suddenly you come into this little pocket of granite. This pocket of granite that's you know, maybe three times as wide as this building and a few hundred yards long, and that's it. Tiny little pluton that's been revealed. And it was, and it was known about um, because the West Berlin Granite Company set up shop here quarrying this tiny little pocket of granite for the span of about 50 years in the 1800s. And when you're here, you'll find this awesome little quarry pond here, spotted salamanders and Jefferson salamanders breeding here, FYI. Um, there's little piles of granite tailings of blocks that they cut out that broke. So all over there's these big, you know, rock outcrops of, uh, of just, you know, granite tailings that porcupines and fishers are hanging out inside. It's an amazing place. And even if you haven't been here, you have been here. So this is State Street, the Episcopal Church on State Street, right? Um, and this, rock, this church was built from granite from that quarry. And so if you were to look up close at the rock, the granite that I'm passing around, um, it is going to be exactly the same as the granite up close on, um, on, these, on these stones on the Episcopal Church. So I, I wanted to start by talking about granite like this just because Montpelier has such an important uh, role in Vermont's granite industry. This is a, a slide I grabbed from Paul's talk last week, so courtesy of the Vermont Historical Society. But this is kind of looking down Stonecutter's way um, taken from, would this be taken kind of near where Sarducci's is right now maybe, looking down that way? So there used to be a really active granite um, finishing industry along the Winooski River um, once the railway went in here in the 1850s. Um, and so, yeah, again, Montpelier doesn't have any granite, but a lot of granite came through Montpelier, and so as a result, a lot of buildings in Montpelier uh, were able to benefit from that. Let's go back to the Episcopal Church. But has anybody walked around to the back side of the Episcopal Church? Fascinating. This is one of my favorite um, structures in Montpelier. Now, the framing around the edge of this chimney here is uh, our features of granite. You can kind of see that gray, these gray blocks, right? But everything else looks like bricks, doesn't it? But it's not brick. It's the Waits River Formation bedrock. And it just so happens that stuff is nice and slabby. When you crack it and break it, depending on if you're in the right spot in these formations, it breaks into a nice flat thing that you can pretty easily make into um, something that you could make a really um, sturdy field stone foundation or stone wall, or actually lay it like bricks almost um, in structures. And so I haven't seen any other buildings in Montpelier that take advantage of this. Have any of you seen other, other places that, that utilize Waits River Formation rock in its construction? Certainly foundations. I, as I was wandering around Montpelier looking for this rock, I really wish I could have seen into the foundations of these buildings because I'm sure that uh, most of the foundations in our city are either made from Moortown Formation or Waits River Formation, depending on where you are. Does anybody have a stone foundation? Wh which one is it? I, I never thought about it. I'm going to guess that it's Moortown because it's pretty great. Um, 
Yeah, are you on this side or that side? Okay, so uh, yeah, we're just like, that's a, <laughs> yeah. So so you could you could actually have either right there. I should just say that this little purple stripe down here that's like a hundred feet wide. That's kind of an inter intermediary zone of um. That's that's basically it's like the Waits River Formation. Um, it behaves very similarly, and I don't want to. I'm just gonna wave my hands and just say let's not worry about that right now. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking our house and many other houses. On the north branch in town, the foundation of the riverside of the house is the stone sickle place there mm -hmm. to make the channel for the river. Yeah. Sometime around 1860 or 65 or something. That's a great point. That's actually a perfect segue into the next place we're going to visit, too. So thanks. Um, oh, yeah. So that's the rock from the Episcopal Church. Comparing that to the outcrop, this, we're going to go here tomorrow, too. This is. Um, uh, at the bottom of Sabin's Pasture near the Pioneer Street Bridge, right? Oh, we'll come back to the, uh, the river abutments in a moment. Let's talk about Hubbard Park Tower. This is all Moortown formation. See the greenish blue? And there's other stuff mixed around in here. But the Hubbard Park Tower, right, um, this is, the construction of this started in 1915. We had a railroad, so we could have had things that were, you know, brought into town to build stuff out of, but no one is carrying rocks up to the top of a mountain um, to build this tower. Instead, they're dismantling the stone walls that were around the, around the park and using those stone walls as the construction material for, um, for the tower. <clears throat> and so it's really fun to go to the tower and get a sense of what the local geology is like by just looking at the characteristics of these stones. You see, this is, um, this is that Moortown formation, it's that blue, bluish green rock. But we're looking at an angle of it that's really showing the metamorphic warps and things like that. All, as this rock heated and got pliable when the Green Mountains were formed, you know, created these kind of ripples and whatnot. If you're in one of the rocks that's going around, if you look head on at the rock, you can see these ripples too. What's the name of that rock then? Um, the, it would be called um, either a phyllite or a schist. Okay. Yep. We, t like we want categories for things in terms of names of stuff. Like we want it to be either a limestone or a marble or a schist or you know, sandstone. But in reality, you get these intergrades between all of them because it totally depends on just how much pressure this spot got versus that spot right next to it. Um, and so I love, the, I love the mess of it all. It makes it easy to <laughs> do a lot of hand waving. Um, we have these chunks of quartz that form in, in gaps and fissures and seams in the, in the rocks. When the mountains form and the rocks cool and you end up with big cracks and voids inside the rock, groundwater fills into those spaces and the silica that's dissolved in the groundwater precipitates against the edges of those <coughs> voids and fills in over time. Kind of like if you put like a, a popsicle in a, like a sugar water um, cup and you leave it there for a while, you'll get that like sugar candy popsicle. Um, same thing's happening uh, underground, but it's silica forming in the voids, and it forms these big quartz boulders, right? So a lot of more town formation um, kind of all over the place in this tower. And some sides look more weathered than others, and some, some of these rocks might be coming from a little farther east, some of that purple, little that purple slice as well. But I don't want to, I don't want to belabor that point right now. Oh, actually, what I will belabor, though, is, is kind of one cool thing is see how some of the rocks are very nice and rounded off? Yeah. And some of them are nice and angular. So we have like a rounded rock. And this one is pretty angular. This one's pretty rounded. This is pretty angular, right? Um, you can tell which rocks have been tumbled around by a glacier um, and which ones haven't um, by how rounded off they are. You know, this being underneath a moving glacier will, will do that to you over time. <laughs> So some of these rocks you can tell were probably taken out of the soil that were till stones that were left there by the glacier. And others were rocks that were maybe chipped off of a, a ledge or an outcrop nearby and then placed into place. So I invite you to scrutinize the tower next time you're there. National Life parking lot, the Waits River Formation, the black stuff that rusts a little bit orange, right? Right across the river from that same spot is the um, Moortown Formation at um, Greenmont Cemetery. And when you look up nice and close, you can actually see those metamorphic folds in some places of when this was hot and under pressure like taffy as it was forming in the greens. 
backing up, this is what that formation looks like farther back. And now you can really get a sense of that blue-green kind of tinge to this, this rock outcrop. Anybody here in 2005 to see this happen off of Elm Street? So this is more town formation um, showing its, its weakness when it is uh, aligned in a certain way where water can get down in there and freeze and thaw and crack things off and, and cause, cause rock falls. You're asking about why a house might be structurally unsound on a, near, near a ledge of more town formation. This is uh, you know, maybe one of the reasons why. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? It's yeah, it's right across the river from this spot, yeah. This is more town formation, yep, up Cliff Street and everything, yeah, yep. So back to our bridge abutment, or uh, river abutment things, right? I love this spot because this shows the entire bedrock history of, of Montpelier in one spot. Let's zoom in on this. Can folks recognize where this is? Bettenales Bistro, this is the Lane Street Bridge. Let's look closely. The bottom here, more town formation. On top of that is stacked slabs of the Waits River formation. On top of that are stacked slabs of cut granite. And I wonder if you could do a timeline of the, um, the history of embankment and raising of this embankment based on you know, what kind of rock is being used. Right across the river from that is, uh, this is the other side, all big granite, granite blocks here. I think they probably just used whatever was handy and lying around. So yeah, I mean, maybe just down, down the road, somebody had a pile of this stuff lying around, or you know, they brought, they, there was a, you know, a bunch of tailings of, of Waits River formation that they could bring over on a rail car really quick or something. So it, it was convenient uh, is probably the only answer. So yeah. So now, with, with your trained eyes, you can tell that the Bethany Church is uh, weird. It's a beautiful <laughs> church. I love the architecture, love it. But this ain't Montpelier Rock, right? This is Moncton Quartzsite, by the way, from Burlington, Colchester area. This was built after the Montpelier Railroad got its spur into town. So finally, at this point, once we got into the 1860s, you could build a building out of whatever you want because you can get rocks from quarries from all over the state to your city. Prior to the 1850s, you had to use what was lying around, right? Um, so use that, you know, so scrutinize the buildings that you see in terms of the rock that you see and you can maybe start to put some, um, some timelines on what you're seeing. And I'll finish with this great photo by Wayne Fabush that he posted on Facebook a couple uh, weeks ago of the State House. Um, now I think that the, um, the State House was cited where it is by geologists because if you were to pick a perfect spot to perfectly represent the entire story of Vermont's bedrock geology, you would put the State House right here because the boundary between the Moortown Formation and the Waste River Formation runs right across the middle of the State House lawn. If you walk out the, the western door of the State House, you are walking into Moortown Formation. If you walk out the eastern door of the State House, you're walking into the Waste River Formation. And I just think the odds of that are just so poetic. Love it. So that, um, if, you, if you kind of go and get a sense of what it looks like over here and then go and compare to get a sense of what it looks like over there, you'll see the difference. Because it's actually in this weird um, purple zone, which is just kind of messy, it's kind of hard at this spot to really see a, a, a clear slice between the two. Um, but there is a place that you can see a clear slice and it's super satisfying. And that is, um, and maybe some of you know a different one than I do, but the place that I love is the northbound exit ramp into Montpelier. So let me take you on a trip there. Um, so as soon as you get off the northbound exit ramp in Montpelier, notice the, uh, the rock escarpment turning suddenly from the black Waits River Formation immediately into the blue-green Moortown Formation right there. Um, so this is called the Richardson Memorial Contact, right? And um, I don't know why, but it has a name. And that is the spot where you put your finger on one side of that versus on the other side, you're spanning 60 million years of geologic time. One side of that, you're touching the rocks that were put there by the uh, Taconic orogeny, and the other side, you're putting the rocks that were formed by everything eroding into the ocean after that, and then being shoved back up in the Acadian orogeny. And isn't that nice? Yeah. Yeah, sure. 
and looked to see if I could find the spot because I was also intrigued by the Times Argus article, which actually talks about that state house location. And I couldn't find a, a good, reliable spot. So it's, it's there, um, but it's, uh, I, I, couldn't see, I couldn't see it. But also the rocks were wet too. Um, and so once things dry out and you know, maybe in a different season, it'd be a little more obvious, but we'll collectively keep an eye out for that. Uh, Becker, who is his first name? Larry Becker um, wrote an article in the Times Argus uh, talking about, um, basically talking about, you know, the, talking about, about this, about how, you know, the state house happens to be in a really unique place geologically. And he doesn't go into all the detail that I just bored you with, but um, does explain that these two sides are very different geologically and that the state house is this cool dividing line and suggests that you can go behind the state house to an escarpment right there and actually see that line. I didn't see it, but. I, okay. Well, then I believe him, but I didn't, I didn't see it. So collectively, we'll go find the spot um, somehow and report back when you, when you found it. So I want to get into our act two, which is a shorter act than act one, uh, but very interesting as well. So we're going to talk about the glacier junk now, when the earth, why the earth, where and when and why the earth is flat in some places. So we're going up a layer of our geologic landscape, and we're also going way to the end of the spiral, to this little gray blip on the very end, the last 20,000 years of the story of the earth. Now, one thing that folks often get confused about when we think about geology, I hope, hopefully I can just put to rest, when we talk about rocks and bedrock, mountain forming and stuff like that, we're talking about things that happened millions of years ago and processes that took millions of years to happen. When we talk about glaciers and sediment and, um, and sediment deposition, we're talking about things that happened thousands of years ago and took hundreds of years or even tens of years to, to happen. So different, different time scales entirely. So we're going much more into our recent past here. And we're gonna go to about 20,000 years ago at the um, peak of our last, uh, our most recent ice age. And at this time, all of the northern part of North America was under this big ice sheet called the Laurentide Ice Sheet. And, um, and it, we were covered under that ice sheet for quite a while. Vermont was entirely covered by a mile thick ice up until about 14,000 years ago. And that ice, that glacier as it advanced, kind of scoured everything. It kind of wiped the slate clean of everything that was above the bedrock at that time. Now, I couldn't find a picture of what it looks like to be under a mile of ice, but I wanted to find at least a picture of a lot of ice um, to, to hopefully convey something. So this is maybe 100 yards of ice. Um, and what, what things might have looked like at certain times when you're looking up you know, the North Branch Valley or looking up Little River or something like that. But during the glacial maximum, the top of Mount Mansfield was under the ice. We were talking about a lot of ice. <clears throat> now, when glaciers start to melt and they start to retreat, they don't, you know, so glaciers actively advance and they push and scour things in front of them. But when they tr retreat, they don't turn around and like march back north. They just melt in place, right? They melt from the edges inwards. Kind of like if you put an ice cube on the table and you watch it melt, like the center middle of that ice cube isn't gonna, it's, that's gonna be the last thing to melt. Melts from the outside in. And so um, the edge of the Laurentide ice sheet retreated or receded to the north. And as that happened, uh, river uh, uh, watersheds would be impounded um, by those glaciers. This is actually a place, this is a Google Earth shot from the Viedma Lakes in Argentina, which is a really cool example of this process that happened in Vermont 14,000 years ago happening today elsewhere. So we have this big glacier that's retreating um, out of this watershed. And as it's retreating out, this is the glacier up here, the glacier forms a dam that backs up a whole reservoir of water behind it. That reservoir is made of all the meltwater of that glacier as well as all of the rainwater and snow melt and everything from the whole watershed here. And this lake will stay here and it fills up until the water can find a different outlet through a different mountain pass to escape from. But as soon as this glacier retreats far enough out, um, then this whole lake will drop down like pulling a cork, um, like pulling the plug in the bathtub, right? Now let's look at our landscape here. 14,000 years ago, uh, Montpelier is right here at the E of lake. There's the North Branch. 
North Branch, Little River, Mad River, Dog River. What's the name of this river? Jail Branch? Down in Williamstown? Um, anywho, so this is a glacial lake, Winooski, that was formed by all of the glacier. That, so the ice had retreated out of the mountains, but there's still a vast amount of ice in the Champlain Valley that was acting like a big dam blocking up this whole reservoir of water behind it. Um, right at about. Lake Champlain, is under, is like lake Champlain is under here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Could you point Montpelier, Montpelier, Montpelier right there. Here's the uh, Worcester Range. Um, so yeah, Montpelier. And um, yeah, so, so the, the Winooski River, the, all the water coming into the Winooski River Valley could not drain out the Winooski River into Champlain Valley. Instead, the water built up until it could find the next lowest mountain pass, which is here at Williamstown Gulf at like 279 meters. Um, so this is just another map of the same thing, Glacial Lake Winooski. Um, but then the, the ice retreated far enough out that the Winooski River, uh, or that, that this was no longer the lowest point in the Williamstown Gulf, but instead there was a channel that opened up where the Winooski River could get its way around the Huntington Gorge and out through um, Hollow Road into Hinesburg right here. There's a giant sand quarry right here in Hinesburg at the intersection of Hollow Road, and that's why. Because for a short time, the entirety of the uh, central Vermont you know, bathtub was draining catastrophically right out of here and running into uh, Glacial Lake Vermont. So as the glacier retreated up the Champlain Valley, there was another glacial lake that was formed um, uh, that was being backed up behind it, where the flow to the north was being blocked by the, the, dam, uh, by the ice itself. What was the time scale for that drainage? So like how fast did it happen? So this happened in like, like days. It was, I mean, however long it takes that much water to get out of there. Like, this wasn't something that happened over the span of years and centuries. This was like, like you don't want to be standing here. Like, um, this, this was happening in you know, hours or, or days all this was draining out. So very catastrophic lowering, pulling the cork in the bathtub, right? And, and so then we ended up with this new lake level, this new step in the staircase of our glacial lakes, Glacial Lake Mansfield. And then the ice retreated far enough north that the Winooski could no longer needed this outlet here, and it could instead resume uh, its normal course into the Champlain Valley this way. And the lake level dropped again to, um, to a lower stage of Glacial Lake Vermont. Um, Montpelier? Montpelier is, uh, where are we now? Uh, there's Little River, so we're here. Yeah, this is the North Branch Valley. Right, we are right there, right now. Um, some, something like that. But this will make it easier. So here we are in Montpelier. We are up the North Branch over there somewhere. This is Vermont Compost. This is, anyway, Montpelier, Terrace Street, uh, Route 12 South, the solar panels behind National Life, like Child's Garden, right? Um, Winooski River. So here we are. This is what would have been underwater, Glacial Lake Winooski. So this is just a short period of time, 14,100 years ago to 13,800 years ago. There'll be a test on that later. Um, but no, this is like, so like for 300 years, Montpelier was inundated um, up to this level, about 900 feet in elevation. It varies depending on where you are um, based on um, the rebound of the earth from the weight of the glaciers. I won't get into that. But um, importantly, um, Today, when sediment runs off of our mountains, it runs downhill and dumps into the North Branch or into the Winooski River, right? So sediment works its way all the way down, and it, it pours into the river, and the river carries it down. But if you have a lake in the way, those tributaries come down, and they dump their sediment wherever that lake happens to intersect that drainage, right? And so, um, and there was a lot less vegetation around at this, at this time, too. This was more tundra-like at the time. Um, and so you have all this, this erosion, all this sediment running down the mountains. And as soon as it hits the edge of the lake, it dumps it out in place. So um, we end up having essentially like a bathtub ring of, of sand and, and gravel and sediments along the edges of our glacial lakes. And if you go to certain places in Montpelier, you can find those bathtub rings. But it's not just Glacial Lake Winooski. Once, the, the, uh, once that level dropped down one stair step, 
you know, the lake level dropped down to here to Glacial Lake Mansfield level. For another 300 years, it stayed there at about 700 feet above sea level. And we get another series of bathtub rings there of sediment that, because now the tributaries can come down farther and they hit the, the lower lake level and they dump the sediment there. And then Glacial Lake Vermont dropped again. There are a couple intermediate stages between these two things that I'm just, for the sake of simplicity, just know that they're there and know that as the lakes retreated, they didn't do it gradually over time. They did it catastrophically suddenly from step to step to step. And so we see stair steps of, of sediment in certain places. Now, this is complicated a little bit because we've had then 11,000 years of erosion happening that has obliterated and washed away and buried um, that evidence in most places. But there are some places where we can still see evidence of that, which we'll go into in just a second. In fact, we're going on that tour right now. So the first place we're going to go is up to the edge of the Wrightsville Reservoir, just looking north from the dam. Because this is a good mental image of what it would have looked like back then. The Wrightsville Reservoir is at about 625 feet above sea level. So this is kind of between Glacial Lake Mansfield and Glacial Lake Winooski in height. But if you imagine kind of looking north you know, up the reservoir, this is kind of what the whole valley would have looked like. The whole all of central Vermont would have been kind of looked look like a big reservoir like this. But we are stopping on the dam because we're actually on our way over to Ananda's Gardens, OK? So we are in an incredibly hilly town, right? There's a lot of hills. There's um, a lot of mountains. There's a lot of uneven uh, landscapes. When you find something that is flat as a pancake, there's a reason for that, right? And Ananda's Gardens is surrounded by hills, but it is exactly 701 feet above sea level, and it is flat as a pancake. And I interpret that as where uh, rivers are running into the shores of Glacial Lake Mansfield. And so all of this is depositional, the sediment being deposited into, into, that, uh, in, into that lake. So that would have been like a big beach, you're saying? Like a big delta, like a big river delta, basically. Or a beach or a landslide. There's different, you know, different variations on a theme of sediment hitting the edges of this, um, this lake. And then all the energy of that moving sediment drops out. And so you end up with basically a big flat bench. Um, but, but yeah, Sandy. We're going to go down a little bit farther south. And we're going to take a turn up Bull Duke Road and go to North Branch Cemetery. Has anybody been there? Mm -hmm. Bull Duke Road? Yeah. Flat spot. What do you think the elevation of North Branch Cemetery is? 701 feet above sea level. Let's go to somewhere else. We're going to go now down here and up the Terrace Street area. And we're going to go up to like Dairy Lane, that area. Um, other than this hill I'm taking the picture from, has anybody noticed that that whole, that whole area is very relatively flat? Um, so we know that these flat spots, they grow cemeteries because it's easy to put graves in sandy soil. They grow agriculture, like Ananda's Gardens, because it's easy to, to grow crops there. They also grow neighborhoods really well, right, these, these flat spots. And so uh, the Terrace Street neighborhoods here, um, between 650 and 700 feet above sea level. Let's jump across the river. Um, now we're on Route 12 South, and what's the name of the neighborhood like down below Westview Meadows? Is there a name for that? Um, you know what I'm talking about, though. <clears throat> like, I don't. I don't know. I wasn't sure if there's a name like the Meadows for it or something like that. Is there a place name? No. Okay. Yeah. But but you know where I'm talking about, right? Um, so again, super flat here, right? 695 feet above sea level is this road. <clears throat> Um, so now there are red herrings out there. There are places that you'll find in Montpelier that happen to be flat at 695 feet or 700 feet. There are places there, so you, there can be, you can be thrown off. But, um, but you know, the, it's uncanny that you find a lot of these spots right at the edges of Glacier Lake Mansfield. We can go to other spots. We're gonna go, up, we're gonna go back up to Sanders Circle now. Um, uh, so up passing on is up Horn of the Moon Road to Sanders Circle. And now we find some flat fields that are right at the shores of Glacial Lake Winooski, a little bit higher up. Continue down the road to Jacobs Road, heading, uh, actually this is Gould Hill Road, um, heading down, uh, down towards the Nature Center this way, so heading you know, west on Gould Hill Road. Suddenly it gets very, very flat here. Um, this is right at the shoreline of Glacial Lake Winooski. So, Jesus, have a huge yes. 
absolutely, that is one of them. And I figure that not everybody knows where Stephen Seats lives, so I didn't mention that one. But yeah, right up Gold Hill Road here, um, the, there's a perfect flat bench that is, um, that is part of this story as well. Yeah, so just pull up Google Maps and just look around and see what you find. And I, and I want to encourage everybody that this is the beginning of a citywide scavenger hunt to find more examples of this stuff, because it's super fun. Um, so now I want to leave you with one last um, fun thing to, to think about in terms of Montpelier's um, uh, glacial history. Montpelier is nothing if not, if not a good place to go and look at bricks. Right? We have a lot of bricks um, and a lot of brickwork. Um, brick is made of clay with a little bit of sand mixed in as aggregate. Right? And just because the bricks are red doesn't mean the clay was red. Um, the, the firing of a brick oxidizes the iron in it and it turns it red. So just because you have a red brick doesn't mean the, 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 the clay was red in the first place. Our clay around this area is all, um, you know, it's, well, it's clay colored. It's, it's gray, right? And, um, and so I want to just, you know, think through something with you, which is a lot of the buildings here in Montpelier were built long before the railroad was put in. Um, and just like it's very difficult to move rocks very far, it's also very difficult to move a ton of bricks very far, at least enough to build big buildings. And so um, back before railroads were connecting us all, um, it was um, generally kind of the rule, more than the exception, that bricks were made um, from materials that were, that were found locally, that were fired locally. Let's look at the uh, Vermont Mutual Insurance Building next to, like, between the, the, the theater and the post office, right? The building was built in 1826. And if you look up close at the bricks on this building, they're just a mess. Look at that. See all the sediment and aggregate? There's particles of all sorts of different size in this, right? This is, this is old brick. And also look at the shape of the bricks, right? Of, of all the ones that are facing kind of horizontal, the ones that are like spanners, look at how they're all slightly different sizes. Some of them warp up and down. Some of them are rounded on the corners. Um, these are handmade bricks that were, that were um, you know, made from local clay. Now, we were talking about what happens to the edges of these glacial lakes, right? If you go out to the dead middle of these glacial lakes, that's where all the clay and the silt is collecting, right? It's down at the bottom of, remember, if we're trying to find clay in Lake Champlain, you go out to the middle of the lake and drop a, drop a core down there. Go out to the middle of glacial Lake Winooski, and you are right over the top of downtown Montpelier. Has anybody been to Blanchard Park behind the Montpelier Senior Activity Center? If you haven't, it's a great little spot to go. It's a couple, only a couple acres. But that's right. That's this little. That's this little hill right here, and that is a giant lump of clay. Now, this entire area over, like all of downtown Montpelier, would have been just wall-to-wall -wall clay deposits. But the rivers over the last 10,000 years have have cut right down through them and washed them away and eroded it away. So we don't see a lot of evidence of clay deposits right in downtown Montpelier because of the scouring effect of the modern Winooski and North Branch. But we do have plenty of clay around to build buildings with. I don't know for sure that Blanchard Park, if the, the hillside of Blanchard Park was a site where clay was excavated from to make bricks to build the buildings in downtown Montpelier. Could be. And I would love to know if anyone has more information on that, because that would be super exciting to find out. But I think it's very cool that our brick buildings, our older brick buildings in Montpelier, are built out of the lake bottom sediment of Glacial Lake Winooski. And so we are looking around downtown Montpelier at our glacial history around us everywhere. This is the Rialto building um, across from my like, Capitol Grounds, right? And this is the brick there. Much more consistent uh, grain size, but still really irregular shapes, right? See how this brick is kind of bends upward here, and, and these bricks are a little bit um, less, they're not super consistent. So these are, again, old bricks, but from a different clay source or a different aggregate mix that was probably still local based on when this building was built, um, but not from the same place as the insurance building. How about the building that Bear Pond Books is currently in? This is a zooming in on these bricks. Look at what these bricks are made up of here, right? Old building, messy brick, wild clay, right? Compare that. Remember how we looked at the Bethany Church after all the rock stuff? Compare that to the Skinny Pancake building right now, and look at the brickwork here. These bricks are oil struck or water struck bricks. They are modern. They are made of clay sources, like extremely pure clay sources, um, you know, much, much younger and much more modern, brought in from elsewhere. 
And so as you wander around downtown Montpelier looking for better escarpments and whatnot, also be looking at the brick, because a brick is not a brick is not a brick. The way that that brick looks can tell us a little bit about um, where that, that brick came from and whether it is from our place or whether it came from, from elsewhere. Um, so last slide is just I wanted to give a couple quick acknowledgments. I want to thank um, basically all the geologists that have done all the hard work of making this sort of thing possible to know in the first place. Stephen Wright's been instrumental, George Springston, uh, Margie Gale, and everybody at the Vermont Geological Survey. Uh, I want to thank Charles Johnson for some of the illustrations that I used um, from his Nature of Vermont book back in 1998 that was published. Um, I want to thank uh, Walter Pullman over at UVM for some of the geology diagrams, uh, Claire Dacey for that great watercolor, and of course the sponsors that made the PLACE program happen in the first place here, Hunger Mountain Co-op, Ben and Jerry's Foundation, and the Vermont Community Fund. So um, I invite everybody, well first, to join me tomorrow on a little field walk. Again, where is that happening? Gateway Park. What time? Nine, Nine noon. Nine noon. Underneath the interstate. Yep. Yep. Um, so, and whether or not you can come on that field field trip, I encourage you to go on your own field trip and see if you can find some of this evidence. And again, this is the very beginning of the story. I'm really excited about this idea, and I, I want I look look forward to the community mind uh, and eyes going out and seeing if we can uncover more evidence in this story here. So thank you, everybody. Um, Nona, we have, oh, would you hit the lights again, Nona, please? I have some time for questions. I'm happy to stick around if anybody would like to ask some questions. Well, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Why does granite come in different colors? Why does granite come in different colors? Um, OK, so um, I don't, so, so, um, in granite, you have black stuff and you have white stuff. Sometimes you have pink stuff. Um, so this is feldspar. The black stuff is mica. The, the white stuff is quartz. And the stuff that's also white is feldspar. <laughs> and if you looked really close and you knew what you were doing, which I admit, admittedly don't, you can tell the difference between the quartz and the feldspar up close. But sometimes the feldspar is pink and not white. And so that gives you pink granite. And the proportion of the mica to the quartz to the potassium feldspar to the plagioclase feldspar gives you the overall kind of look and feel to that particular kind of granite. Yep. So our, our berry granite quarries you know, are white and black. We don't really have the pink stuff here in Vermont, do we? Oh, really? Oh, so I don't know that. If they have pink, maybe it's from here. I have never seen the pink, uh, pink granite in Vermont, but I'd be excited to learn that it's here. Yeah. So um, I think that one's marble. Is it marble? Yeah. yeah, which is metamorphosed limestone. Um, and without knowing, without looking at the map, I'm not sure the, the origin story of, of that, that marble per se. Sorry. Very, in Bethel? OK, OK. We do have great marble quarries down in southern Vermont. OK. It looks like when you're driving the interstate, it just looks so shiny and bright and yeah. pure. You know, my, my initial inclination was like, oh, that, that might be marble. Yeah. But it wouldn't make sense for our, the story that we've been telling, because it's not that far away, and it is part of the same plutonic origin story. So for the mar, anyway, yeah. Yeah. This, yeah, one quick question. I know the way through the formation, which underlies a lot of East Montpelier, is really good at land, and it's got a lot of line in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the source of that line? Oh, such a great question. It doesn't seem like it's like, you know, animals, Yeah. So the source of the lime in the, in the Wade Super formation is the result of a couple of different things. So, um, so that the Wade River, depending on who you ask, people have either called it limestone, they've called it marble, they've called it sandstone, they've called it limey sandstone, they've called it sandy limestone. My favorite was... Uh, Sophie Veltrop with the Northeast Wilderness Trust, she calls it slimestone. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Um, but um, so that depositional environment was, um, so there's two things happening. It was near shore. So there was you know, biotic life that was dying and stuff like that. So there, there was a biotic component to, to, the, um, to 
some of the sediments that were there, but also it's um, uh, clastic limestone. And so remember at this time, the Green Mountains were eroding away into the ocean. And the first stuff to erode off the Green Mountains was all the calcium rich stuff because that's most easily dissolved in, you know, in, in rainwater. And so you have all this calcium rich um, sediment that's winding up in the ocean um, near shore amongst sand and silt and all kinds of other stuff in this messy near shore turbulent water. And that is the, the kind of the sediment that, that all kind of became the Waits River formation. So it's the, it's the clastic influence from the, the um, eroding greens. It's some of the biotic stuff from it being a near shore environment. And the crazy thing about the Waits River limestone or Waits River formation is that you can go, you know, you can walk 30 feet and you can find an area that's super um, um, like neutral pH soil with lots of, you know, calcifiable plants growing on top of it. And you go 20 feet away and you're looking at like Christmas fern and a hemlock tree, like something that's very nutrient poor. It totally depends. I love this. It totally depends on what happened that day 400 million years ago at that, the end of that tributary. What was dumped out into the water there? So this gets back to that like geological determinism, right? Like a bad day 400 million years ago <laughs> tells you whether or not you have maidenhair fern or a hemlock tree today on a particular rock, which is great. <laughs> Yeah. Barry? Yeah, I'll show you. Oh, um, where's Barry on the bedrock geology map? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I showed some pictures. Okay, here we go. Um, so. Berry is all this stuff. Wow. It's little, right? But it's high quality, right? So you, can, you know, you, you 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 can go to some of these plutons and you can't cut a block of granite out of it, right? Like it doesn't it doesn't work. It's not it's you know from a commercial standpoint, it's not it's it's no good. Um, which is I think why they the West Berlin Granite Company at that little tiny spot in Berlin um, didn't really quarry anything else because they ran out of rock that you could you could cut into, into good blocks. And so, you know, Barry is small but mighty in terms of its, you know, granite quality. You'll have to help me with this. That's, let's see, that would be over here, right? The stuff? This cluster here is Woodbury? Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, because this is like Worcester. Yeah. Well, this, this map, you know, if you just Google Vermont geology map, this will be the first thing that pulls up. And you can, and it's extremely high resolution, so you can zoom right into like your street and see exactly what's going on there. Yeah. What's the price? So over the years, I worked with a lot of gardeners around Montpelier, and they were all dealing with clay. And there was a rumor, at least may or may not be true, that a lot of the topsoil was taken from the state house lawn. <coughs> Interesting. So, um, first, I'm curious. Raise your hand if you live in Montpelier. Okay. Keep your hand raised if you have clay soils. Now, raise your hand if you have sandy soils instead. So, where do you live in Montpelier? North Street. North Street. So, up toward up high at towards the edge of the glacial lakes, right? Right. Yeah, where the sandy stuff was being deposited. Does everybody else live? In the bowl. <laughs> um, Next to the river. <clears throat> Sean, I live right near that Clarendon Avenue neighborhood, the, the flat one. Yeah, um, Redstone, and we have clay really quite close to what I think you were saying was the flat areas of the sandy. Um, bear with me one second. Clarendon, is that, is that up terrace, like the Terrace Street neighborhoods? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that slide that you had. Um, things can change quickly. Yeah, yeah, and um, 
and also when I'm trying to just get a slide up here that will help explain both of these things. Um, okay, no, you hit one of the two lights, please. Thanks. Perfect. Okay, um, so you can end up with sand on top of clay. Um, and if the clay gets washed off, or if the sand then gets eroded away, you're just left with clay. So lots can happen over the 11,000 intervening years. Um, but remember, if let's say, okay, over, we're, we're gonna go over to Clarendon now, we're over here, right? So we are way out in Glacial Lake Winooski, we're way out in the middle of the lake here. The shore is, is way up towards Portal Road, right? And so over here, the first thing that's depositing on top of the bedrock is clay or silt or just fi fine sediment that, you would, that a gardener would interpret as pretty clay stuff, right? And then when the lake level dropped, that same exact spot is now much closer to shore, getting much coarser sediments deposited directly on top of what was the, the clay stuff. So you can, um, and then as soon as, then we go down to Glacier Lake, Vermont, well now the tributaries are just running straight through this and now they're carving down through all that sediment that they just put in place. And so you can have a cross section where you have different types of sediments um, depending on where you were in relationship to the various different edges of the lake. So the, the clay that you're seeing is probably clay from Lake Winooski, uh, Glacier Lake Winooski, and the overlying coarse sediment has, you know, has been sloughed off or something like that. Yeah. But I also have not dug like a test pit out in in, in those, in those uh, neighborhoods, so now I really want to um, go and check that out. I'd also point out that this whole field here is dead pancake flat. I tried to get a photo of that, but I couldn't really find a good place to park and do that. But that, that, uh, that field just up Terrace Street is, uh, is, that, is, that a good, is a good candidate for uh, Lake Winooski. Nona, could I trouble you again for the lights? Thanks. Um, well, we're just after 8.30, so I, I want to, um, I'll, I'll stay up here for a little bit. If folks want to come up and ask questions and look at rocks and stuff, um, but I do want to release those that are itching to, to go have their Friday night. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and uh, <laughs> see you tomorrow. Class